Hello guys, um, welcome to our presentation. I'm Alex. I'm Amelia. I'm Colin. I'm Charlie. I'm Harriet. Um, we're going to compare two different newspaper companies. Um, one has been really successful, the Mail on Sunday, it's still running today. Um, and the other is the News on Sunday. They were both launched in the 80s and we're going to explain some factors to why they've been so successful and the other one has failed so badly. The Mail on Sunday was launched in May 1982 and it was a sister paper to Daily Mail and had links with the MGT, which is Daily Mail and Journal Trust. They have a right centre stance and as of 2012, they have 1.7 million circulation and 4.7 readership and it's the biggest Sunday paper in the Britain <coughs> because like, uh, combine, the combined sales of Sunday Times, Sunday Telegraph, Observer and Independent on Sunday are still less than the total sales of Mail on Sunday. Right. Uh, the News on Sunday is a tabloid newspaper that was launched on 26th of April 1987. It was born after the ashes of the left-wing political group called the Big Flame. Uh, the founders successfully raised £6.5 million through individual investment, trade unions and local authority pension funds. The paper had to sell over 800,000 copies per week to break even. However, due to factors such as poor marketing strategy and inconsistency of the political stance, after just the first month, the circulation had dropped to under 200,000 copies. The founders never managed to salvage the situation and the whole charade was shut down within eight months. We're now going to look at the key factors needed for launching a product. Does anyone have any ideas of how, what would make a success to launch a product? Yeah, no? Any factors at all? Something that when you were launching a product, what would you look for? Uh, lack of substitutes. Yeah. Okay. Lack of competition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So these are the key ones we came up with product, branding, and mission. Here on Sunday initially was not a success, as uh, they aim for a circulation of 1.25 million per week, and by the sixth week, the sales were just picking up 700,000. And what they did was they brought in Sir David English as their editor, and in November he redesigned the paper, and they were acting on their bailing results. So David English uh, brought in three new parts, which was uh, sponsored part work, which was a cookery book, a color comic supplement, which was an innovation for the Sunday newspapers in the UK, and a magazine called You, which was targeted to women. And he managed to increase the circulation to 840,000. In order to break even, the News on Sunday had to sell 800,000 copies per week. By the first, their launch paper only managed to sell 500,000, and by the sixth week, they were down to 200,000. This was partly due to their creative product not conforming to what the public wanted. The articles published were irrelevant to left-wing reading, with their first headline being about a Brazilian man selling his kidney for money, of which one reader remarked, that is not something you want to read over breakfast. The dummy paper they produced was of poor quality, and to help them with their declining sales, they invested in, a, in an expensive advertising camp campaign through BHH, who had little experience working with newspapers, another wrong decision made by the founders. The on Sunday was set up by Associated Newspaper, and Associated Newspaper ran daily mail since 1896, therefore they already have a brand name, as Mail on Sunday is under the same brand name. And as of 2013, their revenue is 931 million pounds, which shows how successful they are. Unlike the Mail on Sunday, the News on Sunday do not have the advantage of having a sister paper with an established market share of the newspaper industry. This made attracting an audience large enough to get 800,000 copies in terms of sales to survive a much harder task, especially as this was the first attempt by the extreme left to enter the mainstream public life. The search for investors proved problematic, but eventually the 6.5 million required by the paper was raised. With the Transport and General Workers Union being the biggest single investor, they invested over half a million pounds in the project. Like any successful company, the Mail on Sunday had a clear mission. They set out to appeal to the mass market and did this through a right of centre stance, which appealed to a lot, of, which appealed to a larger portion of society at the time. They also set out to lure readers from more serious Sundays and create space for what people find interesting, such as sports, the arts, and theatre. 
the expanded on this with the addition of supplements that, um, that brought in the variety of content attracting readers. The variety of content attracted a number of companies from different industries who wanted to advertise in the paper, which we'll talk about later. With a lack of authority and poor management, the organisation quickly develops a strong blame culture. Discord amongst management in meetings wastes a lot of time in decision making and was also a contributing factor to the loss of the organisation's values. Um, initially, the founders had envisioned a strong left wing stance to oppose the right dominated media of the day, whereas in actuality, their, pub their published issues were heavily watered down. This, as well as their poor marketing campaign, spearheaded by the phrase, no tits are a lot of balls, seem to directly contradict their claimed organisational values, such as the supporting of equal opportunities to all. With an already limited market, this was sub-ideal for their reputation and was a large contributing factor to their failure. Here is a short video that will demonstrate their poor marketing strategy that was poorly received even by members of the company. Hello, John Brown. I know it's true. So there's news on Sunday. A new paper that's on our side. And it'll expose everything. Except girls on page three. So, you're the naked truth instead of naked women. Read news on Sunday. This Sunday. What was your reaction? Oh, I thought it was appalling. I really did. I mean, it's clever and sexy and all those kind of things, but I mean, it was... It was anathema to, I thought, what the, you know, the politics of that paper and the, I mean, it's no, it's no better than putting a nude on the top of a car at the, at a car show, it seems to me, it's, it's, it's raising in the sexual frisson in order to sell something which has nothing to do with sex. The Mail on Sunday had been hugely successful with the inclusion of adverts within the paper, often featuring promotions and discounts. They recently conducted research on Sunday papers to show why advertising on a Sunday is such a strong asset, allowing that Sundays are more um, are different to other days, with it being a day of rest and a day to enjoy your own time. The study found that we're in, we're in more control of media on a Sunday. For example, when it rain doors on a Sunday at home, there are no billboards or external sources to influence us. We're also more time spending readers on, reading papers on a Sunday, and supplements only extend this reading time. Papers are usually read before a high street shop too, giving advertisers a unique window to pitch. Here are some examples of recent covers of Mail on Sunday. As you can see, the promotions are often featured on the cover. Advertising has been crucial to the Mail on Sunday success. We came up with three factors of success for launching a product. Politics, location, and experience management. Location played a huge part in the Mail on Sunday success. Its offices were on the right... Oh, no. uh, Mail on Sunday was, as mentioned earlier, they have a right center stance, and thus it appeals to mass market. Because at the environment at that time was very right wing with the Thatcherism, and the newspaper has no extreme views in politics. Also, they have the support from Maggie Thatcher since Sir David English was politically closest to her. I would be alright to pick on you two for a quick example. What's your name, sorry? Tom. Tom so I'm going to be taking on the persona of Ed Miliband. I'm sure you know he is, he's the leader of the Labour Party. And, sorry, Rosie. Rosie. Uh, you're going to be Maggie Thatcher, no longer with us, but we all know who she is. Um, now, if you kindly all just picture these two on a dinner date. Um, cutting the small talk aside, Ed might start criticising Maggie's right-wing policies during the 1980s, which led to a large number of job, job losses across the UK. By this point, Maggie would probably be steaming at the ears about throwing a wine in their face. This is understandable. I mean, polit politicians love a good fight, and after all, their jobs do depend on it. Um, just throw in a couple of views that the two strongly disagree on, and what follows is a politically correct fight to the death, and probably a ruined tablecloth. The point is, success for political parties are down to the consistency of the views advocated by their politicians. This similarity can be drawn across the media and the fail of the news on Sunday. Once the news on Sunday, once the news on Sunday was launched, the founders took on manager, the managerial roles and hired journalists to write the stories for the paper. However, the journalists didn't write within a, the required framework, as was set out by the political agenda of the organisation. This all, all boiled down to poor people management and leadership, which was due to the lack of experience on the part of the founders. One of them, Henry Stewart, said, and I quote, 
I often think we should have done quite the opposite and hired a group of managers and us as the founders take on the roles of the journalists. Secondly, I'd argue that the News on Sunday's polit political mission was far too strong to start with. Big investors immediately shied away from the founders' lack of interest to make money. Their aim was nothing short of changing the world, and all else was secondary to this mindset. These extreme views were further detrimental to the organisation after its launch, in that they let their political ideals get in the way rather than focusing on producing a marketable newspaper. <laughs> Location played a huge part in Miller Sunday's success. The offices were based in London's Fleet Street, which was the heart of the UK journalism, and it gave um, Merlin Sunday a first-hand view of the latest stories in Westminster. News on Sunday decided to move away from the political hub of London on the basis that they believed there were more people than just the Londoners, and a lot of their target audience were living in the North. This caused them to miss crucial stories and instead report those that were not capturing readers. Experience management was perhaps the Merlin Sunday's biggest strength. When the Mail on Sundays launched in Joe's plan, Sir David English, who was editor of the Daily Mail, set up a task force to change the fortunes of the paper. Associate editor of the Daily Mail, Stu Stephen, was put in charge, and the impact was instant, with circulation rising from 700,000 to 1.25 million in just its first edition. Stephen was also praised for his strong appointments, and he went out of his way to, to, to hire the, the top journalists in the country, notably John Juna, the former Sunday Express editor, who was labelled as the best known Scotsman in England by the Independent and Julie Birchall, who works as a columnist. With the wealth of experience and background of their employees and management, the Mail on Sunday were always in good stead, in good stead to become a success. In August 18, 1986, the News on Sunday began search for an editor. Keith Sutton seen the ideal candidate with his heroic status as editor of the Walking Place. This was a strike newspaper after Rupert Murdoch had sacked 5,000 workers and the introduction of the Sun Times and the Sunday Times to a high-tech plant in Wapping. So, with, with four months to go to launch, the process of recruitment began. Revolutionary at the time, the news on Sunday actually advertised the job. Instead of hiring experienced professionals, appointments were actually being made based on politics rather than ability. This went completely against what John Pilger had advised Keith Sutton to do. John Pilger actually said the paper needed experienced journalists, not enthusiastic amateurs. As a result, this led to employees being put in job positions which they simply had no experience in. So here's a video highlighting that lack of experience. Everybody seemed to end up with a job they hadn't done before. Was there some notion that if you want to do something in a different way, it's a good idea to put people in posts who haven't done it before? No, not at all. I, in fact, I think that's kind of um, a bit unfair. Actually, where people had to have a particular knowledge base, I think they had a particular knowledge base. I was head of personnel and equal opportunities. And had you done that job anywhere before? No. Had you ever been um, foreign editor on a national paper? Before? I'd never been foreign editor of any national newspaper. And had you ever worked in personnel before? No. Had you ever been editor in chief of a national newspaper? No. Had you been the editor of a national newspaper before? Um, no. Here's a graph illustrating the circulation figures of the two papers. As you can see, the first two months were fairly similar, with flow figures that were falling. However, by November, the Mail on Sunday had been launched and drastically increased their figures, where the News on Sunday had folded. To link all this together, we looked at Blaker Mouton's um, managerial model. It was a leadership theory based on a man managerial grid that separates leadership styles into five sections, defined by how much the business has a concern for production and people. The News on Sunday falls under the impoverished section with low production and people. The leader, Alan Hayling, is ineffective and doesn't try to get the job done or create an environment where employees feel motivated and satisfied. This results in a disorganised, disharmonised and dissatisfied work, work environment. On the other hand, Mail on Sunday has the characteristics of, of a business with a team leadership displaying high production and people. Blake and Mouton felt this was the best managerial style as employees have an understanding of the organisation's purposes and how they can help to achieve these. The work environment here is one based on trust and respect, leading to high satisfaction and motivation, causing high production. It is clear to see from what we have discussed in the two papers that for the success of any organisation, one requires these key factors. One, a good marketing strategy to launch the brand. 
Two, the product must be representative of what the organisation promises to provide. And finally, and most importantly, good management and leadership. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just wonder, group one, if you want to take a seat for a second. Now, the other groups, if you want to spend five minutes and look at your questions again and come up with some other questions, maybe based on that presentation, <coughs> we'll come back and uh, have a couple of questions.